Good morning. The authors of Scripture, especially when it comes to the epistles of the New Testament, were writing to address issues going on in the church. To the church at Galatia, Paul wrote his letter to remind them of the true gospel because they had gone astray into legalism. To the twelve tribes of the diaspora, James wrote his letter to show how works must follow faith or that faith is actually not legitimate. And in the first letter that the Apostle John wrote to the churches, he's writing to a fledgling church who is being attacked on all sides and who are really in need of assurance of their salvation and of their standing with God. In our passage today from John chapter 2, verses 12 to 14, John gives us a recall to the fundamentals and he extinguishes three fiery darts of Satan that the devil uses to take away the assurance of God's people. He writes to three different groups of people in the church, each with their own struggle, and he helps them to remember the truth about who they are in Christ. If you'd open up your Bibles now to 1 John chapter 2, today we're going to be looking at verses 12 to 14. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we are in a battle. There is an enemy who wants to destroy us, who tries his best to take away the assurance of God's people, to make us question our relationship with you, to accuse us day and night before God and accusing our own consciences. Lord, we need your assurance now. Help us to remember who you are and our relationship with you and what you have done for us. May this be a church whose believers have assurance of eternal life. Lord, I'm so thankful for your servant, John. I'm thankful that he is always pointing the church back to Christ. Help me to do so. Help me to always only point to Christ. Help us to have our hearts and minds set on Jesus. Lord, we're so thankful for everything you've done for us. Open our hearts now. Open our minds to receive what you have to say to us through this letter of your servant John. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 to 14, John writes, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Now, there are three main views about who John is actually talking about in this passage. The first is this. He's talking about literally children, young men, and old men in the church. But that would be sort of a slightly odd order then, because first he says children, then he says old men, then he says young men. So that... Seems a little weird. The second main view is this, that all of his readers are children. He says that in chapter 1, he's writing to the dear children of the faith, and that the young men and old men are two groups of church officials, like elders and deacons, or uh, that they are newer believers or mature believers. The old men are mature believers, and the young men are new believers, and children are all of us. I think that that one maybe holds more weight. The third view is that these are stages in the Christian life, but true of all believers. That there's the baby Christian stage, and then there's the young believer stage, you know, as you're growing, and maybe you've walked in the faith for a few years, and then there's the old believer stage. Uh, but again, it sort of is a, a strange order then, if that's what he's talking about. 
But regardless, all Christians should have the innocence of childhood, the strength of youth, and the mature knowledge of age. And there may be elements of all three of these views in this passage. Now, which one do I hold? I think probably, even though theologians are uh, divided on this topic, I think probably the second one is the most likely, that when he, John is talking about children, he's talking about all the children of God because he keeps using that word children over and over and he's writing to the church and calling them children. And that when he's talking about old men and young men, that these are old men are people who are more mature in the faith and young men are people who are newer in the faith. But just keep that in mind that this is not a, a steadfast thing that all Christian uh, commentators all agree on. They disagree on what the meaning is about who John is writing to. Regardless, all of these things apply to us. Look at verse 12. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. This verse is written to give us assurance, to call us to remembrance that our sins are forgiven by Jesus. John says, I write to you, dear children. Who are the dear children again? In his gospel in John chapter 1 verse 12 he writes but to all who did receive him that is Christ who believed in his name he gave the right to become the children of God not everyone is a child of God only those who receive Christ who believe in his name to those people he gives the right to become the children of God these people are adopted into God's family by faith all believers' sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus. I was just doing last, uh, about a little bit over a week ago, I was doing a Passover Seder at a church that was down in Oak Park uh, near Chicago, and uh, I was drawn to Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 26, uh, where it's uh, during the Last Supper. It says, While we were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. When we take communion, we remember that, that the blood of Christ was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And it says here, in verse 12 of John, 1 John 2, it says, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. What does this mean? For the sake of the name of Jesus, we are forgiven. This is so crucially important, church. We are not forgiven because of who we are. Listen now. You are not forgiven because of who you are. It's not as though God looked down from eternity in the past and he says, ah, this person is so lovely. They're so sweet. I'm going to forgive them. I'm not going to forgive that one because he's really mean. No. No. No, we're not forgiven for our namesake. I'm not forgiven because my name is David Lovey. I'm forgiven by Christ for his name's sake. We're forgiven because of what Jesus and Jesus alone has done. And salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Why is this so? Why is this so that we're forgiven for his name's sake? Seems like an interesting way of phrasing it. Because Jesus Christ's active obedience in living a perfect life under God's holy law and his passive obedience in dying the propitiatory death of the cross is so honored by his Father that those who are in Jesus Christ by faith are accepted by God the Father just as Jesus is. Do you understand? Jesus lived a perfect life. We almost forgive uh, forget that part of the gospel. The gospel so many times is talked about in the negative that Christ died for our sins, to take away our sins. And we almost forget the active obedience part of Christ. 
that he actually lived a life under the law perfectly. He lived the life that we were supposed to live, perfectly following God's law in every respect, never sinning, never having any lies come out of his mouth, never thinking an evil thought his entire life. We can't even understand such a thing. We can't really understand what it was, what kind of a life Jesus lived because our life is not that. It's not that. Our life in so many areas uh, is not actively obedient to Christ and to God. But Christ lived a perfect life. And the life that he lived that we can't live, is credited to us on our behalf. And his passive obedience in taking the death of the cross is so honored by the Father that those who are in Christ by faith are accepted by God the Father just as Jesus is. You see, friends, we hear so much about we are not saved by works, right? We're not saved by works, amen? Are we saved by works? No, we're not saved by works. But I'm going to tell you something right now. We are saved by works, just not ours. We're saved by works. Our salvation is absolutely by works, by the works of Christ, by what Christ has done, and nothing, nothing at all in what we have done. That's why John says it is for his name's sake that our sins are forgiven. Not our name's sake. Not because of who I am, but because of who he is. Amazing. Amazing, actually. I want to read you Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 to 6 in the King James Version, because I think that it gets this point across better than I can uh, get it across to you. Paul writes this, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Adoption of children. Let me just pause there for a second. Who is John writing to here? He says, little children, I'm writing to you to remind you, to tell you that your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. All right, so Paul is saying we've been adopted as the children of God by Christ according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. What does this mean? Accepted in the beloved. Who is the beloved? Matthew 3.17 gives us the answer. When Jesus was baptized, behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So when Paul says we are accepted in the beloved, the beloved is Christ. And so we are accepted by God if we are in Christ. In Christ, God looks at us as beloved as well. He looks at me, sinful David, sinful Dan, sinful Terry, sinful Dina. He looks at you, not as sinful, but as beloved in his son. If you're in Christ, he doesn't see your sins anymore. They're buried at the bottom of the sea. Therefore, by virtue of union with Christ, we who were dead in our trespasses and sins, we who were rotting in the corruption of our sinful nature are now beloved of God. Amen! <laughs> if, that, if that doesn't cause you the greatest joy that I might be beloved of God, that God cares about me. Oh, but don't you know what I did? Don't you know what I did last week or the week before? You know it, Lord. You see all of these things. And he says, all of those are buried at the bottom of the sea. You are accepted in the beloved. I'm writing to you, children, because your sins are forgiven. Forgiven. Free. You're free in Christ. Amen. In Christ, you are free. Hidden. Your sins are hidden away. God forgets about them. 
He'll never remember them anymore. See now, it makes a little bit more sense. John is writing to a church that is struggling with assurance because they're being attacked on all sides, not only by humans who are killing them, but also by the devil who's trying to get in their heads and tell them, yeah, what kind of a Christian are you? What kind of a person are you? Here's the question I have for you, friends. Remember, just a few weeks ago, we were talking about sort of what the Christian life looks like and progressing, walking toward Christ. And, and I gave this illustration where, you know, you cross from death to life, but you're still sort of even some sins from before might have followed you into the Christian life. And, and because we're in the flesh, we still have to struggle with certain things. And I have different struggles than you have. And you have different struggles than she has. And all of that, right? And in my illustration that I gave you, I was walking like this, all right? And then you're progressing in the Christian faith and you're more mature over here. Except I, I, I should have probably given the illustration like this that, well, maybe getting caught here. <laughs> All right. But the Christian life is not an easy walk like that. The Christian life is more like this. Ah. It's stumbling. Stumbling toward Christ. Tripping toward Christ. That's really what the Christian life looks like. It's tripping toward Christ. Falling down and getting back up again. And moving toward Jesus. And sometimes the road is harder than others. But you must know this, says John. Little children, children in this church, your sins are forgiven. If you believe in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. All of this is on account of the name of Jesus, no one else. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 3.18 Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. See, John writes the same John. The same John records the words of Jesus in John 3. And he says, Whoever does not believe stands condemned already. See, condemnation is not something which will happen in the future. If you don't know Christ right now, if you don't trust in his name, if you're not in Christ, like we, I've just been talking about, if you're not stumbling toward him, tripping toward Christ, then you're not going to be condemned. You are condemned right now. And the only way to come out of that condemnation is by faith in Jesus. Coming to Jesus, trusting in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus must be held in the highest esteem, friends. His is the name that is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, that's all I can preach to you, is just Jesus. All right, that's all I have to preach. If you want to come here next week, you know what you're going to hear about? Jesus! Amen. That's it. I don't know that much. I'm actually pretty dumb in most areas. But I know Jesus. It's just a side note here. I want to tell you that um, the name of Jesus must be held in the highest esteem by Christians. All right? And so, really what that means, Christian, is if you're using his name as a curse word, you need to stop doing that. His name should be so highly honored. God honors his name. His name is the greatest name ever. We're saved on account of his name. So don't, when you're upset or angry with your spouse or angry at traffic, don't say Jesus as a byword, as a curse word. Don't do that. Don't do that. Only those who are outside of Christ can do that. Really. Really. 
John chapter 20, verse 31 says, These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 5, it says this, have you uh, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess Jesus is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Isaac Watts wrote this. Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. But Christ the heavenly Lamb takes all our sins away, a sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. Amen. Amen. Look at the next verse in verse 13, part A. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. So he writes to the little children, your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. He writes to the fathers, you know him who is from the beginning. And he's reminding us again that God is a God who can be known. God is a God who tabernacled with us, who put on flesh, became a human being. Even mature Christians need to be reminded that Jesus is and has been with them on every step in their journey. You know Jesus has been with you, Christian. He's been with you. He's been walking with you and holding you in the palm of his hand. What a comfort to know that the Lord was there from the beginning. From the beginning of the world... He's always been there. From the beginning of our lives, He's been there. Even before we knew Him, even before we knew Him, He still knew us. From the beginning of our Christian walk, He was there. And that's the reason why I'm telling you right now that Jesus Christ will not love you any more or less in the future than he loves you right now, no matter what you have done. He will not. And so when Christians come to me and talk to me in my office and say things like, well, but how can God still love me? I mean, I love him, but look what I've done. Look what I've done. I feel so bad. I want to... I want to ask for his forgiveness, but how can he still forgive me now? And I say to them, when he forgave you when you came to him in the first place, he already knew you were going to sin in that way. He already knew it, all right? He knows every day of your life. Every single one of your days was written down in his book before one of them came to be, all right? So you don't, like, catch Jesus by surprise. You don't catch him by surprise. He already knows. He knows. He knows you, and you know him, if you indeed do know him, if you trust him. He's there from the beginning of our Christian walk. Listen, Jesus has been there, Christian, from the beginning of your marriage. He's been there. He knows your struggles. He wants to sanctify your marriage and to make you holy through it. He's been there, and we've known him, and he has known us. And it might be a cliche, but, well, it's definitely a cliche for, for at least some of you, but you know the footprints poem when a man is walking with the Lord, and he's, they're walking down a beach, and they, they're looking back on his life, and he asks the Lord, how come during the hardest parts of my life there's only one set of footprints? And Jesus says to him, it was then that I carried you. It was then that I carried you through. You just didn't know it. And John is writing, and he says, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And then he writes to the young men in 13b, I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. 
Young men face some of the, and women too, face some of the strongest desires and temptations. Now, remember what I said in the beginning of this sermon that who is John referring to? It's possible that he's referring to actually young people. And in this sense, that that would make sense because 2 Timothy 2.22, Paul writes, flee from the evil desires of youth. Okay, so young people in some sense, have greater temptations than older people. Is that true? Have you noticed that? All right, greater temptations. Why? Because they have greater capacity. Why? Because they have more strength. All right? They have more strength of mind. They have more physical strength. Young people just do. And so with this greater potential and ability comes a greater potential also for sin. It can be used for great good and zeal for the Lord, but then the same kind of zeal can be used and twisted and used for the devil. There's a great book for you young men and young women in the congregation uh, by um, J.C. Ryle. It's called Thoughts for Young Men. You should definitely pick it up. He addresses some of these things. Um, Because with youth comes strength of body and strength of mind and zeal, but also with youth comes a lack of wisdom. Right, And uh, that's why so many young people make really dumb mistakes. I certainly did. Lots of dumb mistakes. I mean, we see it even just on the news this last week, didn't we? That tragic story, all around tragic story of uh, Aaron Hernandez, the tight end who was playing for the, uh, the Patriots. And this guy who's in his early 20s is convicted of murder. Murder! Over what? Uh, some drug deal, I suppose, I, as I understand it, right? He was convicted of killing one of his friends over some deal that went bad. And then he was on trial again for another double murder. And, uh, and I was talking with Mike Kalachi earlier this week about this, how, how bizarre this thing is. And this this man who had like everything the world could offer in all respects, truly in all respects, like a king, all right? He could literally live like a fairy tale king. The guy had signed a contract with the Patriots for $40 million, and then he like goes out and starts killing people. It's like, on one hand, it's like totally bizarre. How how could he do that? On the other hand, it's the deceitfulness of sin. It's the deceitfulness of sin that even when a person has everything, the devil can still be at work in, in their heart and, and twisted this guy's mind and giving him this gangster mentality. And he's just a young kid. His mind was warped and twisted. It's tragic. It's tragic all around. And then he ended up killing himself last week. He's still in his 20s. He ended up killing himself. Oh, what a wasted life. Sometimes, I I think we we can see that. It's on the news all the time. These kids who make like horrible, spur of the moment decisions like to kill themselves or whatever because their girlfriend brings up with them and, and like they're not thinking. They're not They don't have wisdom. They're not thinking about the future. And that's because those who are outside of Christ, whose grip are they in? They're in the devil's grip. Anyone who's outside of Christ is in the devil's grip. Are they not? But here, listen to what John says to the young men. I'm writing to you, young men. These people who really are in need of wisdom, of victory in their life, victory over sin and temptation. He says this, I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. Amen. Because Christ who lives within you, if you are living within him, Christ lives within you. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how old or young you are in the faith. Christ can give you victory. John says he's writing to the young men because you have overcome the evil one. He tells them that they're no longer bound in sin. Christ has already won the victory. Satan can only trick a believer into thinking that they're still in his clutches. He can only trick you into thinking that. He can only make the temptation seem like it's so overwhelming you can't say no to it. 
But God always gives a way out. He always does. In Jesus, we can overcome the devil. Look what he says. Not just that we can, but that we have. Christ already won the victory for us. In Matthew chapter 12, starting at verse 28, uh, 28 to 29, Jesus says this, Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. See, what, what he says here is that he has already bound the evil one. The devil has no power over the believer. Your chains have fallen off. Your heart is set free if you are in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 13c. I write to you children because you know the Father. Again, John emphasizes that as Christians, we can know and have a relationship with God the Father because Jesus has made him know. Known. First John, or I'm sorry, the Gospel of John 1.18. No one has ever seen God. Why is that? Well, because God the Father is invisible. Jesus says, no one has ever seen God, but God the one and only who is at the Father's side has made him known. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In John chapter 14, verses 8 to 10, Jesus says this. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do, not, do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. And so he says, I write to you children. Now, if I'm correct, that children here, he's talking about the whole congregation, the whole church. He says, children, you know the Father. You know God the Father. You know Him because you know Jesus. If you know Jesus, you know God. I found that even though all true Christians acknowledge that God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, most of us, if we're being honest now, listen, if we're being honest, most of us feel closer to or seem to understand one member of the Godhead more than another. Isn't that true? That sometimes we feel closer, like... I can talk to Jesus, and I don't really understand the Holy Spirit that well. <laughs> or, or other people might say, oh, the Holy Spirit, he dwells inside me. I, I, I feel like I know the Holy Spirit the best, if that's a way of putting it. And other people who've had, like, really great dads in their life, their fathers, their human fathers are really wonderful, and then they hear about God the Father, and they say, I can understand God the Father, because I've had a really great father, a father who cares about me, a father who loves me. But you know, some people who have had bad human fathers who haven't cared about them, they have a lot of trouble relating to God the Father, right? That happens sometimes. It's because our human nature and limitation in grasping the mystery of the triune God is sometimes difficult to overcome. But John here reiterates the answer that he heard Jesus give to Philip. Jesus said to Philip, when Philip said, show me the Father, I just want to see the Father, and then I'll truly believe Jesus. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because I and the Father are one. This is something that our human minds can't really understand, how God can be three in one. And whatever kind of um, illustration that we can give with like some people say an egg and different parts of the egg, no, that's modalism. That's not a good uh, description of the Trinity. Or some people say the Trinity is like water, like steam and vapor, uh, steam and liquid and ice is solid and that's like God. But also, um, it's not really a great illustration the best illustration we can give is this. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right. That's it. And here John says, if you know Jesus, you know the Father too. Look at verse 14a. 
I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. Now, look at that. Look at 14a. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. 13a. And then 14a, I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. Do you ever notice sometimes that old people need to be told things twice? (laughs) Old people need to be told things twice. John doesn't say it three times, so I don't, have to, I, don't, I don't have to repeat it again. He's making sure, friends, that, that we get the point here. Look, the three things that he's covered so far, I'm going to go over them. First, our sins have been forgiven by Jesus' sake. You need to know that. Second, we know Jesus, our advocate, who is from the beginning. Third, He has won the victory for us, and in him we have overcome the evil one. We are no longer in bondage. Like a good preacher, he repeats his points for us. (laughs) All right? And so I don't feel so bad that I always repeat myself anymore. If John does it, then I can do it. All right? If John does it, then I can do it. (laughs) You guys are really quick. So... (laughs) Let's look at the end of the passage here in verse 14b. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. The word of God abides in you, he says. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, Paul writes, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Training so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, he says to the young men that the Word of God abides in you, therefore it is training you. You're growing because the Word is in you. If the Word is not in you, if it doesn't abide in you, how can you be growing? Do you know, it's possible, friends, it's possible to be a literal old man and to have gone to church for 30 years or 40 years, even this church, for that long, and still be a baby Christian. It's really possible. You go to church for a long, long, long time, and you're still a baby baby Christian. Or it's even possible you go to church for a long time, you're not a Christian at all. Here's the question. Is the Word of God dwelling in you? Is it, are you being trained by it? Is it working and moving in your life? How is it dwelling in you if you don't know it? How is it dwelling in you if you don't read it? It will not be dwelling in you if all you do is come to church and you hear it preached here from the pulpit every week. No, that's, that's like if you just eat one meal every week. Think about that for a second. How emaciated would you be if you only ate one meal every week, even if it was a rich meal, even if it was a really heavy meal, you only eat on Sunday morning, and then you don't eat again for the whole rest of the week, how are you going to survive? You will look like a skeleton. You will be barely alive. That's what happens to all of you who come here and listen to the Word and say, great, I went to church this week. That's good. Next week I might open the Pew Bible again. How will you grow? You will will then, for somebody like that, friends, You'll come to church and think you're doing your Christian duty, okay? And you're coming to church and you're listening to a sermon and you will never grow. You will be a baby Christian when you're 70 years old. You must allow the Word of God to dwell in you richly, to change your life. And in order to do that, you have to read it. You have to know it. You have to listen to it on your audio Bible if you don't like to read We live in a time where we have technology where Max McLean can read the Bible to you. All right? You don't need to. If you're not good at reading, I don't care. That's not an excuse. 
Listen to it. And at the same time, friends, at the same time, what potential you have to really grow. Some of you, I mean, I, some of you really put me to shame in your own walk of faith, walking with the Lord, trusting the Lord, living for the Lord for years and years, and you've grown and grown, and I learned so much from you. And that's what will happen if you allow the Word of God to dwell in you. John says to these young men, these young Christian men and women, he says, I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the Word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Jeremiah 31, 31, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. The Word of God lives in you, says John. And so he encourages these young, strong, Bible-loving young believers to have confidence in Christ. Have confidence in Christ and not in yourself. Do not put faith in your faith. Put your faith in Christ. Do not esteem yourselves. Esteem Christ, and then all will be well with your souls. Remember that you are who you are by the grace of God. Paul says, I don't deserve to be an apostle, but I am what I am by the grace of God, and His grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I. God who lives within me. The God who is working in His life. That is what enabled him to live for God. Well, that's it. That's all I have for you now. You know, sometimes people say, oh, there's, there's rules to preaching. Like, you have to land the plane. <laughs> I don't believe in that. My sermon is done now. Let us pray. Oh, Father, thank you so much for giving us assurance, for showing us, helping us to remember, because it's so easy for us to forget. It's easy for us to forget the fact that in Christ our sins are gone. Our sins are covered over. It's hard to remember that sometimes when we're in the midst of the battle. Lord, sometimes it's hard to remember that we really know you and you know us. And we have a, a real relationship with you. We almost forget those sweet times of fellowship that we've had with you, walking with you. We almost forget it in the midst of some attack of the evil one. And we need to be reminded, ah, you know God. You know him who is from the beginning. Yes, Lord, we do. In Christ, we know you. Lord, sometimes it's easy to forget that the battle is already won. That Jesus Christ has already purchased our victory by his death and resurrection. It's easy to forget that sometimes, Lord. Please use these words now in our lives. Help us to live according to your word. Help, us, help the word to abide in us, to live in us. Help us to be strong believers who overcome the evil one, who live and have a victorious Christian life for your sake. Be with this church, Lord. Help us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your servant who has given us assurance this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.